Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to ask a very quick question to the audience. Um, I'd like to put your hands up if you've ever been so frightened in your life, um, so scared that a little bit of pee has come out. Put your hands up. Don't be afraid. Look at me. Don't look at the audience. Look at me. Okay, okay cool. You can put your hands down now. That was about 50, 56% of the audience. Um, and hopefully by the end of this talk, I'll increase that number a little bit. Because today, we're going to talk about uh, web security and hacking. Now, um, I love stories. Uh, I think they're... They're great. And today we're going to talk about hacking, but we're going to talk about it through three different hacking stories. And, uh, well, my, my goal isn't really to teach you anything. It's to scare the pee out of you. Um, but each story is going to have a moral at the end of it, um, a lesson that you might learn, you might, you might apply when you go back to your own projects, and maybe some steps that you can do to protect yourself. Now, it's not going to be Angular-specific, it's going to be web-specific, it's not going to be Angular-specific. Angular is actually a really great framework for building secure applications. But hopefully, that's some of the stuff you're going to learn today is going to um, help you with the rest of your architectural stack. So, my name is Asim, uh, Asim Hussain. You can find me on Twitter at Jawache, not Jawache, but Jawache. Um, I blog about Angular and uh, uh, JavaScript on my website, codecraft.tv. And I'm something called a cloud developer advocate at Microsoft. So I'm actually, uh, actually my boss is John Papa, if you know who that guy is. Um, so basically my job in, in Azure is to basically advocate Azure to developers and advocate developers to Azure. So if, you've got, if you use Azure, if you don't, or if you've got any questions about it, come speak to me afterwards. Um, so you can call me, ask me, say, and I also sell courses on a platform called Udemy and they've recently added automatic subtitling to all of my courses. So on Udemy, my name is Awesome. Uh, just FYI, ask him awesome. I'm, I'm cool either way. Um, so to begin with, let's just talk, just to clarify kind of a bit of a terminology. I'm going to assume people that don't know anything about web secure T. Um, so I'm just going to clarify a couple of keywords. So for instance, von a vulnerability. So a vulnerability is a hole in your security. So if you didn't set up a firewall, that's just a vulnerability. An exploit is a tool or a series of steps or a piece of code that you execute to take advantage of a vulnerability to do some pretty bad things. So that's the definition out of the way. Let's just talk about the first story. Now, who's heard of this company? Anyone? Yeah? I use Bitbucket, whatever. Um, so this is a story about uh, GitHub. So GitHub has something called a bug bounty, which is a, where they pay you if you find a security hole in their software. Um, and this is a story about just an exploit that was found by uh, somebody called Orange Sai. So you can find Orange on Twitter. Here. This isn't my, I didn't figure out this hack myself, it's Orange's. So uh, go follow him on Twitter, he's a really nice guy. Um, deserves everything he gets. So um, this is, this, this is his, 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 his bug that he found on GitHub that I think is a really, really interesting story. And I'm going to take you through that. So um, has anybody heard of webhooks? That's actually just an excuse so I can have a drink. So GitHub. GitHub has webhooks. Okay, so you can set up a webhook on GitHub so that when you do a git push, it is a post to a URL. Pretty straightforward. Okay. So in this one we've got example.com as we set that up as our as our webhook URL. But what if instead of example.com you did localhost? What would happen then? Well, if you did a git push, and then it would basically do a post, it would do a post to localhost. Remember, you can do localhost colon port. So you can then do a post request behind the firewall on GitHub servers to any process on that server. Yeah? No, okay, that is not actually what happened here. Because GitHub's pretty clever people. They, don't, they, they, they blacklist 
certain things. So obviously, they uh, sanitize certain inputs. The a web URL is, is a user-defined input, so they sanitize. They make sure you can't put something crazy in there, localhost being something crazy. So that's blacklisted. You're not allowed to put localhost in. But they forgot about zero. OK, so zero on some services and some platforms can actually resolve to localhost. So now, RNSI has got a way in, right? It's got a way in basically to post behind the firewall to any process on the GitHub server. But what can you do with just that one exploit, that one tiny exploit? Not a lot, to be honest with you. So who can guess, who tells me what, what process has that port number? Any guesses? Elasticsearch. We're going to play this game a lot this evening, sir. Um, yeah, that's Elasticsearch. So if you do a post to port 9200 underscore shutdown on Elasticsearch, you shut it down. OK? OK, so right, found a way in to shut down Elasticsearch on a, on a GitHub server. I mean, it's so maybe a little bit of a denial of service attack, but not. Maybe not a big one, okay? So Orange thought, why don't we just kind of, why don't we look for something else and combine it with this one? Why don't we chain another vulnerability on the end of this? Started looking around with the source code um, on GitHub, incidentally. So found this little application. So one of the processes which is used here is something called uh, Graphite, which is a charting library. And uh, it's an open source charting library so you can use GitHub to figure out how to hack GitHub. Pretty cool, right? This is Python code, people, not JavaScript. Don't worry. I'll explain it to you. So um, it, what this function does, it, this gets called, it's kind of a root func routing function. It gets called when you do a post request. It gets the URL from the query parameters. And then it gets the path, the actual path, not URL. And then it makes a get request to that path, a get request, OK? So what we're doing here, really, remember, the f if you put this as your webhook URL, that first exploit does a post. The second exploit gets the URL and does a get. So that whole thing is posted to send email. It extracts the URL and then just does a get against that URL. That's it. That's all it's doing. So all we've really done at this point is then chain two exploits together to convert a post into a get. That's it. Not really a big issue, right? Well, here's the issue. This is using a library called HTTP connection to actually do the HTTP message. And certain versions of Python have a vulnerability with HTTP connection library. It's called a carriage return line feed uh, injection attack. So if you know your stuff, a uh, carriage return is how you do new lines on uh, Windows, and line feed is how you do new lines on everything else. Um, why does it always get a laugh? Um, and so both of them together is just kind of a cross-platform way of doing a new line. And if you converted that to hex, ODOA. So what if you then did a GET request to this? In fact, what is a GET request? Actually, what is HTTP? Right, we use it all the time. What is it? What is HTTP? Let's, let's break into it. You've probably seen things like this when you do curl requests, or maybe if you're looking at Chrome uh, network tools. What's going on? Well, all that HTTP is is a protocol sent over TCP, which is just a series of, of series of strings. Each string ends in carriage return line feed, and you signal the end of the HTTP message by sending two carriage return line feeds one at a time. If you were just building something low level, you want to send a HTTP message using just some sort of low level TCP library, this is all you do. You'd open up a TCP connection, send strings, end with this. You send a HTTP message. This is what you've done. But that HTTP connection library uh, basically converted ODOAs to new lines. So then, this is what ended up getting sent over the wire. 
okay, mm. what's going on? So the thing is, if you're sending this to a HTTP server, it's not going to know what to do with this message. It's going to go, oh, get. I know what get is. I understand what to do with that. Hello, what's hello? I don't know hello. This is a malformed HTTP message. Get the hell out of there. Okay. So now, what have we done? We've taken a post request, we've turned it into a get request, we've added some special characters into it, so now we can make a malformed HTTP request. Or can we? Maybe we can do something more. What if you use this as your get request? Does anybody recognize what this might be? No? Well, if you converted that to that HTTP, you get this. And what port number is this? Does anybody know? Memcache. Okay, memcache is not a HTTP server. Memcache is something completely different. So now we're opening a port, a TCP. We're using a HTTP library to send this. Well, that library is opening up a port on memcache. And it's sending in get. And memcache is going, I don't know what this is. Why are you sending me this? I don't know what this is. Ignore it. And then you're sending memcache this. And memcache is like, yeah, I know this. I get this. Yeah, I understand this. You want me to set the value data on the value key. Cool. Sweet. Then you're going to send it this. And it's going to go, I don't know what this is. Watch HTTP. I don't know. What? Why are you sending me this? I don't know. What's this? Get out of here. Ignore it. So, what are we doing? We've now got the ability to set data in memcache on a GitHub server. So, whether or not you, th you think you can use, use memcache or not, you probably do at some stage or another in the architectural stack. It's just used everywhere in web development. Um, and as developers, we, we like to store stuff in memcache. Um, but we la we're lazy when we store stuff in memcache. So we like to use libraries, which automatically serialize and deserialize our objects to store them in memcache. Um, so what we might do is we might take our code, serialize into something that gets stored in memcache, and then later on when we want our code again, we would deserialize it from there and execute it, and we're good. But now, we've got the ability to, to store our own data in memcache. So you're going to save your code, you want to serialize it, you're going to store it in memcache, happy. Then later on, you're going to get your code, you're going to execute it, but it's not your code that you're executing. It's my code that you're executing. So, now we're getting a little bit scary, right? So what Orange did is he looked through the keys in memcache, and in the keys you can find out, sometimes if you use certain libraries, the, the libraries will use the name of the class as the key, or as part of the key. So part of the key found one key with this in the, in the name, depreciated or deprecated instance variable proxy. Deprecated instance variable proxy. So instance variable proxy had a known vulnerability. So what they did was they went, okay, in the next version, to force all the developers to, to accept the fact that this is not okay to use. We're going to rename it to deprecated. So as a developer, in order to use this, you have to change your code to use from instance variable proxy. You have to type in the word deprecated into your code um, in order to use it. Okay. So you can't really hold your hand up and say, I didn't know what was going on. Um, and what the vulnerability the instance variable proxy had was that the act of deserial you could change the data in such a way so the act of deserializing it would execute a command on the server. Just the act of deserializing it. So eventually what Orange did was they got all of this stuff together into one webhook URL. Remember the first one? Just issuing a post behind a, a firewall. That was quite innocent, wasn't it? Um, then now we can convert it into a get. Then we can kind of uh, smuggle the memcache protocol inside there. And actually, 
the actual command, if you just put something in between there, whatever you put here, that is a command that will get executed on the server. And that's it. So this is the video that you created, just to prove that it works. Um, go into profile. Go into repo. Go into webhooks. Add a webhook. Needs a script to get the URL. Hi, hi. Gets the actual webhook URL here. Grabs it. Paste it in. And this is something you're just going to run just to see what gets run on the server. And to actually trigger this vulnerability, you just have to do a search, any search. That search will request the data from memcache, will deserialize something, and then that, then that runs the ID command on the server. Hmm. Interesting. So there's a moral here, a story. And the moral is that big exploits are made from smaller exploits. We all like to think that when we get attacked, we're going to get attacked through one big, giant security hole in our application that will be really easy to spot. That's not how it happens. Okay? You get attacked through multiple smaller vulnerabilities that get chained together. A lot of them, look, a lot, lot of the vulnerabilities that were exploited here were not even in GitHub's code. So if you're thinking you found a vulnerability in your code and weren't going to fix it, think again. How's everybody feeling? Wet? Anybody need the toilet? Do you have time for the toilet? No? Okay. Maybe after the next story. So who heard of uh, the Equifax hack from last year? A few? Okay, the largest hack in history affects about 200 million people. It's a billion dollar company. And I think about 10,000 employees. It's not a small company. Um, but actually, before I begin to talk about what happened at Equifax, let's continue with a bit of terminology. So who, who's heard of the term a zero-day exploit? Okay, about 10%, 10 percent, 10 percent of the firm. Okay. So a zero-day exploit is, some, is an exploit that no one's heard about yet. Okay, it's a secret. But once, whoops, but once the vulnerability becomes known, like the companies or the maintainers usually release a patch, okay? So, so there's, if there's a zero-day exploit and it becomes known, it's not a called a zero-day exploit anymore. You might think of it as a, as a three-month, a six-month, a one-year exploit. And kind of the value of that exploit goes down more and more, kind of more time has happened since it's become uh, open source, right? The clock starts ticking. So how hard do you think it would be to get hold of a zero-day exploit? Pretty hard, right? It's really hard. In fact, um, a study was done last year which showed that, because it's hard to know, it's not like an open market, right? But it's hard, it looks like a single good zero-day exploit can cost as much as a quarter of a million uh, US dollars. And you actually get paid in installments when you sell it. So you get paid in installments as long as the exploit remains unknown. Um, so given that, how hard do you think it would be to get hold of an exploit that's been in the public domain for six months? Pretty easy. Yeah, very easy. In fact, just Google it. So this is one. It's called ExploitDB. You can type whatever you want in. I type PHP, uh, hit search, and then um, you probably can't see from the back there, but you can scroll down. There's quite a lot of exploits uh, and vulnerabilities that are found here. And if you look here, I'd made this kind of end of last year, and we're still in 2017, so um, <laughs> PHP isn't very secure. Um, in fact, um, it's even easier than this. There's actually tools out there. I mean, who here, as a developer, um, has spent a day writing a script for something they could probably do in a minute? Quite a lot, right? So why wouldn't, why wouldn't hackers do this as well? And they do. There's automated tools for a lot of the stuff that happens in this community. This is one famous one called Metasploit. Uh, you can kind of point at a website, it scans it from vulnerability. It's also got plugins which will automatically try and exploit 
that code, uh, exploit that site as well, right? So you just point it to a site and I'll try and exploit it. There's even another tool I found out just yesterday or the day before, I think, it just got released on GitHub called Autosploit, which Googles for vulnerable sites and just automatically spiders them and exploits them automatically, right? It's not that hard. So, did Equifax get hacked by Zero Day Exploit? No. They got hacked through a known vulnerability in Apache Struts that had already been fixed for two months. All they had to do to protect themselves was install an update. That's it. But you might laugh, but this is actually really, really common, right? So um, this is a snipe is a kind of no to sneak, sorry, is a no security firm. And they did this report, I think, in two, 2016. Uh, 12 of the top 50 data breaches were through known vulnerabilities. So 25% of all breaches are through known vulnerabilities. And I think this one more recently, they discovered that 77% of all these sites they examined were using vulnerable JavaScript libraries. And in fact, who here, we're all Angular developers, right? So who here is running the latest version of Angular or AngularJS? Wow, like less than 5%. If you actually look um, at both the Angular and AngularJS documentation, the security section, pretty much the number one issue that they have there is keep, use the latest version of AngularJS possible and Angular possible, right? This is why. This is why you need to do that, because you do not want to be that person sitting in front of the CTO explaining to them why the company went down because you couldn't be bothered to install an update. Um, but it's pretty hard to keep track of like all your dependent libraries as well. So if you're using GitHub, you can now use the GitHub de uh, dependency graph feature that came out late last year, I think, where it will actually scan all of your NPM modules and it detects if one of your NPM modules that you're depending on has a known vulnerability and therefore you should go away and go and perhaps patch that and update that one to the latest version. If you don't want to use that, there's actually a tool called like NSP. Um, you can run this kind of as on the command line, you can put it into kind of your build process where you can basically uh, check your, checks through your package JSON, finds kind of similar information and puts it in a command line interface, it's quite useful. Think of it, think about like a linter for your security. So basically to summarize, it's pretty easy to hack someone through a known vulnerability. Um, you can just Google stuff, or you can use automated tools like the ones I showed you. And there's evidence from reports seem to suggest that a lot of us are using libraries with known vulnerabilities. So just use tools like NSP, use GitHub Dependency Graph, Snake, Sneak, and whatever you need to do in order to help yourself out. Now, who has, who's heard of OWASP? Okay, a few of us. Um, so OWASP is, has like a, like a top 10 list of the top most vulnerable features of application. They just literally updated it end of last year. They haven't updated it since 2013. They update, updated it end of last year. And the last three things they had at the bottom, I thought it was quite interesting. So insecure deserialization, we just dis discussed with Memcached. Uh, using components with known vulnerabilities. Well, that was kind of there before, anyway. But the, the last one is insufficient logging and monitoring. And I think that's really interesting because this is actually one of the things that I think Azure is really, really good at. So if you've got lots of, um, when you have an application, you have lots of alerts that pop up all the time, right? But if you were to actually, just to start lots of signals, if you're actually starting to alert on all of them, you'd basically end up with just a lot of noise. And that's what happens. You tend to ignore all of your alert mail. So what we did is we trained an AI to understand all of those signals, figure out when you get hacked by basically figuring out a path of the hacker through your application, and I'll let you then. It's really cool. Um, you can actually see, when you get the report, you can actually see exactly how the hack happens. It's, really, uh, it's a really cool thing to do. And it, I think it costs $15 a month. It's not, it's not very expensive. Uh, have time? Okay. So we have time for the last story. Okay. 
So it might be a bit small for a lot of people, but can anyone guess what this code does? No? Okay, it takes your environment variables and converts them to a base64 string. Okay, so what does this code do? Well, seem to take all of your environment variables and make a hasty to request to my server. Huh. So how many of you keep kind of secret keys, passwords, uh, connection strings in your environment variables for applications? Quite a lot, right? Well, for those of you who aren't putting your hands up, it probably means that you're, you're hard coding them in JavaScript files. So uh, thanks. Um, so what if I told you I could make you run this code on your server? Would you believe me? Yeah? Maybe. Okay, maybe this will make a bit more sense. So it looks like, meh, for those of you who might look, it looks like it's in a, in a file called package setup.js. And actually what this is is an NPM module. So this gets executed when you install this NPM module. All right? So all you've got to do is install my NPM module and you'll send me all of your environment variables. Yeah? I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, okay, Asim, if I installed your NPM module, on my server, yes, I'll send you all of my environment variables, but why would I do that, ask him, why would I do that? Well, again, last year, I think August last year, did anybody see this one, this tweet on Twitter? So, Ken Dodds has a, a package called CrossEnv, which is downloaded, I think, a million times a day, I think. Um, it's a very, very popular package. And somebody thought it was basically stealing environment variables. But what had happened, actually, is somebody had published another package in NPM. Right? So cross hyphen env is the real one. Cross env without the hyphen was the fake one. And the only difference between the two was the fake one had that special bit of code which is publishing uh, your environment variables over to the, the, the hacker's account. I see a couple of people who are uncomfortably shifting in seats now, like wondering, <laughs> wondering what, what's, what, whether they got caught up with this. And it's actually a common thing. If I, I give this talk in like Python conference as well, and they've got the same issue. It's called typo squatting. Typo squatting, right? So um, we all do it. I do it all the time. I think I remember the name of the package. I'm not quite sure. I'll do npm install, see if it works. It works, great, and move on, right? We all do it. But when you think about it, what you're doing when you run npm install is you're basically giving another developer, someone you've probably never met, the right to run their code on your server, behind your firewall, behind every single security feature that you've added to your application. Hmm. So that's something the moral of this story, is that we're just a little bit too trusting, okay? And I thought about this a lot, because when that happened, that really scared me, because what I just described to you is what I do all the time. I have a terrible memory. So I thought to myself, like, why am, I, why am I so trusting and why am I so scared of this? And I think the issue was is that it's an open source package. We kind of implicitly trust everything that is open source because it's out in the open and we think a thousand people are looking at it and of course if there's a, a bug or vulnerability in it, someone's going to find it. But this code was out in production for two weeks before it was discovered, right? Now they think like hundreds of like, thousands of people got caught out. Uh, with this stuff. Um, and, it, and normally I'd, I'd recommend using solutions like what we have stuff in Azure called Key Vault, kind of really secure ways of storing keys. But even that wouldn't have worked with this because you basically can run code as if you're the, as if you're the end user, right? So what are some of the solutions that you can do? Well, there's a couple of solutions now. Um, if you, you can use scoped package names, so this is only if you're publishing stuff on NPM. If you publish stuff on a scoped uh, namespace, then only you can publish uh, stuff like this, and it's kind of a bit more secure. This maybe explains why when we do Angular, it's kind of at Angular, right? But very, very recently what NPM have done is, is a really good move by them, is they've now made it impossible to, um, if, you've, if you've published package dash name, 
you now can't make publish any other NPM modules which only change by punctuation. So it's a really good move, right? But it doesn't help with a lot of cases because, for instance, um, there's ways of um, doing uh, connect co combinations of letters which look the same. It's kind of a common thing that you do. You do combinations of letters which look, look the same if you scan across, but actually it's a completely different package name. And there's a bunch of different issues with that as well. So to summarize, oh, green. Hack, got hacked. So just to summarize, um, basically, update your code. Update it all the time. And if, you, if you're all working on AngularJS right now, if somebody's working on AngularJS, and you're coming up and you're trying to convince your management to help you migrate to Angular, what a great answer to this. Just say Equifax, right? So update everything. There's no such thing as a small vulnerability. There's no such thing as a small vulnerability. Go and fix it. And uh, who got scared with the NPM issue? Yeah? A bunch of people. Um, I don't have a, an answer for that, so here's a unicorn. Um, so that's it. That's all, I want to, <laughs> that's all the time I've got for you today. Um, again, if you want to follow me, you can follow me on, on Twitter at Joeik. Follow me, follow me, follow me. I'll be posting up uh, the slides up there afterwards. I've got links to all the stories that I've mentioned and, and even links if you, to, for regexes that you can run to see if you've got caught with the NPM issue in the past. All right, thank you very much.